Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Vita Academy uh, webinar. Today we have uh, Mr. Peter Peavy. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Morning, Jim. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, another day in paradise in the, uh, you know, the dental world. It's ever-changing, but yet not. Um, so it's always great as a reminder to for everyone to understand what they should master and then be open to uh, learning more, greater things, expanding their knowledge, and adopting uh, new technologies, which is always fun uh, for us. And, and of course, most of you know Peter, but those of you don't, uh, Peter is a worldwide dental educator for technicians, dentists, and auxiliaries, uh, an owner and manager of PD Dental Studio in Staten Island, New York. He has a personal appreciation, expertise on all phases of clinical, laboratory, traditional, digital techniques, color communication, digital photography, and we have done some uh, photography courses as well, uh, which, which are always well-received, uh, Peter, um, so we probably should do a, get back and do a couple more of those as well. Uh, Peter is a board member of the Association of Master Dental Technicians, so hey, you can always contact Peter and see how you become a, a master dental technician, uh, elevate your skills. Um, he's a teacher and educator in the master dental technician program at NYU, as well as a faculty member uh, at the NYU School of Dentistry. A member of the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, which is not easy to become a member uh, of um, as a technician. Executive board member and fellow at the Na Northeastern Nathological Society, editor in chief, uh, Inside Dental Technology, that magazine, which is a really nice magazine. All of you should sign up and uh, uh, get that IDT magazine. A lot of useful information in there. And then the uh, ACP Technician of the Year in 2018. So, again, welcome, Peter. I appreciate uh, you joining us, spending some time educating. You do a fantastic job to educate everyone, and we're always happy with um, having you do that. Thank you, Jim. Just give me that screen, and I'll sit back down here. Great. Thanks, Jim. Good, good seeing you, and I appreciate it. And thanks for the, the topic again. So welcome, everybody, to a, another Tuesday, Thursday webinar. We kind of switch those days up every now and then. Uh, and thanks for joining in. It's always nice to see people signing in. This was a topic that uh, Jim had kind of thrown out a while ago, and, and I went back and looked, and I had actually addressed this topic, I think, uh, once in 2001 and another time last year. So I went back and looked at them a little bit, and I decided to change them around a little bit to kind of create something a little bit different. I, I assume some of you have seen the older versions, but it's always nice to update them and, and kind of mix them up and change them a little bit. Also, before I get rolling, I just want to kind of promote one thing, Jim. You probably should have said it, but I will. Um, I'm hoping that everybody is going to be joining us for this meeting in um, Chicago in November. It's going to be a great meeting with really a great group of speakers, minus myself, but um, the Society for Color and Appearance in Dentistry. It's a, it's a wonderful group of people. The meeting is open this year. Uh, I think I'll be speaking with uh, my buddy Miles Cohn, Dr. Miles Cohn. But boy, there's a, a great um, mix of people there that I'll, I'm actually excited. Marcus Blacks will be there, and my friend Adam Oleshko, who's fabulous, and, and there's so many great people. So um, please join us for that meeting in downtown Chicago in November, which is even nicer because that's before it's usually five below zero. So it's a, even a better time for Chicago. Um, but with that said, um, I wanted to get rolling with our, our task for today, and that's the incisal edge. So when I went back and viewed what I had done, um, I had started off talking about the incisal edge this way. I had talking about it from an optical point of view and a functional point of view. And I kind of went through a, a few different versions of how I look at the incisal edge. And I started off really more functionally, because in truth, I know optically, we want to have all these pretty mammalons and translucencies and things, and those are all really important. But realistically, the three keys to the incisal edge are form, phonetics, and function. And that's the aspect that I focused on in the first version of, of this webinar. For me, I still think those are the keys and those are the importance. Um, and what I harped on during that first 
webinar was really about positioning and understanding where the insights alleged belongs in relationship to the lower insights alleged, to the lip, and to the face. So I just wanted to kind of recap that for a second so we're on the same page with it. And I talked about that with something called Pozelt's envelope of function. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this was developed back in the early, I think in the 30s and 40s is where it really started. And then it evolved. And I think some of Pozelt's articles are actually from the 60s. But um, the point of it was, is they really talked about where the incisal edge belongs in relationship to the lower incisal edge. And we've actually changed that concept a lot today, right? So years ago, it was kind of the lower incisal ledge was the moving one. We kind of focused on where that was. Today, we're really always looking at the, the upper incisal ledge position aesthetically, and then trying to work behind that incisal ledge position in that envelope of function. So this is really kind of the way that I start most of the cases that I'm working through is understanding where the incisal ledge needs to be and then understanding the functional capability of it. And that's how we determine the lower incisal ledge position. But let's be honest, not every case you do is a full mouth restoration. So you don't always have the ability to say, well, I want my incisal ledge here and I'll just move those lower incisal ledges. That's not always a scenario unless, like most of the cases that I work on, you have the ability to control some of that. Uh, and we control that sometimes with ortho, sometimes with restorative, sometimes with vertical development of where we want the OVD to be. So it gives us a little bit of freedom, but <clears throat> I don't have that with every case. So I want to make sure you understand that everything about the incisal edge is really should be thought of as the envelope of function for its final position. Secondly is the aesthetics. And when we talk about aesthetics, I think there's a few different aspects to it. One, not every incisal ledge has three malhons, not every incisal ledge has lots of translucency. They're all very different. And why I think it's interesting is because I don't think we, we tend to see them that way. So for me, I start looking at the incisal edge and, and my first broad spectrum of it is where does it belong in the face? That's the first thought that I think of all the time. And what that really is to me is IEP, incisal edge position. Where do I want that incisal edge to finish in that human's face? And I think that's a really important part to this is because, <clears throat> excuse me, is because we tend to not always think about the, the bigger picture, right? I think especially as technicians, and I know there's a few dentists in there today too, but we tend to always look at the micro and not, or the macro, I should say, not necessarily um, the full picture of it. So what I want us to do is always think from where we're starting from. For those of you who were with me in Chicago, um, I actually focused on this a little bit in Chicago, talking about facial feature and where the incisal edge belongs in the patient's face. And, and the reference that I use, and I use it all the time, is just pretend you're putting a denture in everyone's mouth. Every time you look at a patient, think to yourself, they have zero teeth, and my job now is to figure out where the teeth belong in that face. And that face gives you so much more information about where you're gonna make those determinations from. So if you look at Ella's face and you can see right away in her eyes that she doesn't feel comfortable smiling and that that's gonna be our challenge is to make her feel good about her smile and what she looks like. And how do you do that? Well, you, you do it in the micro. You do it in looking at the face and you say, okay, I see the inside of the ledge position. Where would I put it if I can make it aesthetically anywhere I want it to be? And whether you see that as one millimeter longer, two millimeters longer, three millimeters longer, I'm okay with any of them. I'd like to see them in the face to make sure I understand where it belongs. But the goal of this is where is the IEP? Where does my inside ledge truly belong in that face? And once I make that determination, then the rest becomes a little simpler, right? Because that inside ledge determines where the gingival should be. Average central, central is about 10 millimeters long. Um, so now I have more reference points. Also, if it's going to be a larger case, I can also work on the OBD position and the, and the envelope like we talked about before. But let's jump past that and say, now that I know where the inside ledge belongs, now the question is, what should the inside ledge be? Should it be a very translucent looking tooth? Should it have lots of mammal on? Should it have secondary dentin formation? And I think most of you understand that as teeth age and the enamel demineralizes, which means it becomes more translucent, 
that the secondary dentin usually kind of develops and kicks in a little bit inside the tooth. And that's why you see that ambery orange color that seems to float a little bit more in an older tooth. And let's be honest, if you're making a tooth for a 70 year old as compared to a tooth that's going to be for a 30 year old, you should be making them a little bit different. Not every tooth has three mammalons. Some of them have no mammalons at all. And I think our, our key here is to look at what the tooth should be in relationship to that patient's face. So for me, IEP, incisal edge position, and then what type of an age incisal do I really want in that position? So I'd like you to take a look at some natural teeth here. All these are natural teeth. I'd like to just kind of look at how nice and how different they are, right? Look at these two centrals. You can actually see that they have like three defined kind of ambery pink mammalons in there. And that's where I think a lot of people kind of get the concept of mammalons from, but that's not necessarily always normal. And by the way, they're not normally that pinky amber color. Sometimes they're a little more on the whiter side. Sometimes they're a little bit more of a yellow hue to them. Uh, as compared to these teeth, look at these teeth and say, do I see definite mammalons in there? Maybe I kind of see a little more of a whitey kind of a tip in them, but look how much different every one of them is. There is no incisal edge that's exactly the same. And when I kind of float through all these pictures, like I'll, I'll close up them for you, you can start to see that none of these are really the same. Like, so I call them all snowflakes, right? It's like a, a snowflake that, you know, they always say there's no two snowflakes that are alike. Well, there's no incisal edge that is completely alike there. They're always a little different, even adjacent to each other from eight to nine are the ones. They're always a little bit on the different side of what those structures look like internally. And it's kind of our job to, to understand them and understand what that patient needs. And let's be clear, there's two parts to this, right? Because if I'm doing a full mouth rehab, I have the freedom to create anything I want, although it should still be age and facial appropriate. And again, I only say that because I don't want to make that three mammalon tons of translucency look with rounded edges and, and big embrasure spaces on an 80 year old face. It just would look like fake teeth. At the same time, I don't wanna make them flat and worn and ugly and, and all these colors. I wanna make them somewhat appropriate, meaning that maybe I have a little less embrasure space. Maybe I have a little bit less of a mammalani structure and more of just a slight transition to, to transparency. So. The only way we kind of start to understand all those is really to understand that there are so many differentials in each of the teeth that we're looking at. And sometimes, or a lot of the times, probably for most of us, you don't have the luxury of creating anything you want. You have to actually work in the parameters that you're working in. So I have to think of not only the functional attributes of the case, but also the aesthetic attributes of the case. And I have to be able to conform them into what the patient already has. And sometimes that confirmation or, or that conforming, I should say, makes it where I don't like the tooth I'm necessarily making, right? I'm like, well, I don't really want it there, but that's where it belongs. So like in a situation like this, this was an implant single central, and the patient is a class three patient with a heavy, a heavy true class three where the lower jaw is out in front of the upper jaw. And if I put that incisal the edge anywhere else but where it is right now, I will have a problem. That incisal edge has to be in one specific position. So my job is to make sure that I'm conforming to the environment that I am in the envelope. And this would be a reverse envelope, right? Before when we said Pozel's envelope works this way. Well, in this case, in a true class three, the Pozel's envelope works more this way. And now I have to be a little bit more mindful of where my incisal edge falls. Otherwise, my restoration is going to fail, and that's what I don't want to happen, right? So I want to match the aesthetics, but I also want to match the functional capability of it as I'm working through the process. So form, function, then the aesthetics really kind of come in. <clears throat> the next challenge in the aesthetics is, and I get it in today's world, it's so different. You know, sometimes I feel like when I'm speaking about ceramics, people are looking at me like I'm a little crazy today because everybody's doing so much either micro-layering or no layering, and people are kind of doing a lot of monolithics and, and stain. And on the last webinar that we did, we actually focused on staining techniques, which obviously I use and I teach, but I still think there's a little bit of a, a misnomer that everything can be monolithic. I really believe that we should be thinking about being smart enough to know when we need a little layering and when monolithic will work for the scenario. 
And for me, part of that comes into what you see on the screen right here, what I call the AIR area, the A-I-R. And what I mean by that is there's an area where the tooth actually ends, and then you have the inside of the ledge that you do have to recreate. And how you recreate that has to be a thought process, meaning if I'm going to use a monolithic material, well, that means that I'm going to have a certain thickness of that monolithic material from the facial to the lingual, and I need to know what the opacity and the translucency of that material will be. But at the same time, when I get down to where the tooth structure actually is, that material, which is going to be one material, is going to be a much thinner material. And now whatever I pick to fill the space might not work as well on the tooth. If it's too translucent, it's going to lower the value. If it's too opacified, it won't be as opacified when I make it half the thickness for the facial of that restoration. So when I see these scenarios, I think, can it be monolithic? or should it be a layered restoration? And that's kind of how I want you to be thinking of the restoration is what material works well for what I'm trying to, to achieve? How much space do I have? What material can fill that space the right way and still make it work? So for me, I think the same process along the way. I look at the angulation of my, my tooth and then I look at my facial aesthetic position of my tooth. And you should notice that these two things relate to each other when you look at it from a sagittal view or a facial view. What I mean by that is, if you look at this area here, the cervical, that's the area of the tooth where you always have the most chroma in your restoration. Now, because I'd say the most chroma, it doesn't mean it's orange or brown. It just could mean that it absorbs more light and it has a hint of color influence in it, pink, amber, yellow, and that really depends on the age of the tooth and the surrounding circumstances you're looking to create. That next part of that tooth or the flatter section of that tooth is the middle third. And that middle third of the tooth is really where we see the most value in the tooth. This is where the light really reflects the most from the tooth and always appears to be the brightest part of the tooth. And then lastly, our focus today is the actual inside the edge of the tooth. And this is a free for all, right? Because this is really pertinent to the type of case we're doing patient, age, position, and also amount of restorative, one tooth or 20-something or, or teeth. And all that kind of plays into it where chroma and value doesn't really change as much. They're almost a little bit easier to manage. I usually want a little warmth and I usually want some value. Now the only question is, what do I do on that inside the ledge when I get there? And that area that runs across there would be the most tricky area to run. So for me, it's about the space. How much space do I have after the prep? Was it a minimally invasive prep or a full preparation? And once I start to understand that, then I can start to say, well, what material will work better here? Could it be a monolithic material or could it be a layered material? And I want to be honest, I use them both, but I also want you to realize that how you use them is really important. So uh, it's the question that I've asked a lot over the years, who are you? Who are we? Right? What do you do that separates yourself from the lab down the block or the lab across the country that can market today to all the doctors in the, in the country and around the world for that matter? So who you are is really important. The brand that you build and the brand that you create is really important. And for me, what I always want, and I think I've been using this word probably for 15 years now in teaching is viability. I want us as technicians and clinicians to be viable. I want your patients to be viable to your office, meaning that they see you as somewhere they need and want to work with you. And I want our laboratories to feel like the doctors that come and work with us, they respect and, and admire the work or the teamwork that we do with them. And to do that, you have to be a thinker. You have to be able to, actually, it's funny, we just have a, the main feature in the IDT magazine this month is on that. And I wrote an interesting editorial on it. But uh, the point of it is, is for you to be viable, you have to be knowledgeable. You have to understand which situation you need and how to do it. And something interesting happens. I'm, I live here in New York, and uh, although I travel the world a lot, I don't know how many of you ever walk past a high-end store, the Chanel's and the, and the Louis Vuitton's and the Gucci's. And it's very interesting in New York, you're gonna almost always walk by one of them, and there is a line out the door, around the corner, or down the block. And it's funny to me because these are the most expensive products you can buy in all the stores that are in that neighborhood. And the only stores that have the line 
are the most expensive stores. People wait for an hour just to get in sometimes, especially after the COVID years where they don't let as many people in the stores. And I find it interesting that people are so um, respected of that brand that has been created. Uh, and for me, I'm a, I'm a food junkie. So when I walk through the city, anytime I want to go to my, one of my favorite bakeries in the city, um, which is Dominique Ansel, um, I'm going to tell you, I can't get in. And I don't care if it's below zero or 110 degrees. No matter what day it is, what time it is, there is a line down the block, around the corner, waiting to get in just to have a piece of pastry. And by the way, when they get in, I can tell you, nobody asks about how much or how quick or if the pastry is warranty, if they don't like it. All they ask about is, when can I come back? When can I buy another? I take one for my friend. And this is the point that I'm trying to make with how you build your brand and how people see you. And that's about the knowledge of what you do. And what's interesting is what I don't ever see are lines out the door, except maybe on, uh, was it Black Friday <laughs> uh, after Thanksgiving? Maybe the only time you see a line at these kinds of stores. Why? Because the people who shop in these stores, and by the way, nothing wrong with these stores. I've shopped in them too. Um, the point I'm making is, no one is faithful to these brands. They only utilize those brands for a quick, I need this and I want to get out. I want to buy this and I'm going to move on. If there was another store next door to this one that said bargain and it was a dollar cheaper for the item you want, you would go in there. Yet at the same time, you wouldn't do that with the Chanel store or the Gucci store. So really what's the point of this that I'm trying to make? is know your materials, because can I create a nice and size of edge on a monolithic material? I can, but I have to be very aware of the space that I have, how much space I'm utilizing, and which material I'm going to use to create monolithic, similar to these. I think these are actually uh, Miles cases, uh, Dr. Cohen, so uh, him and I have probably shown a lot of these cases in Chicago this year. Um, but again, this is simple communication, simple monolithics, I can, I can, I don't have to layer these, right? And, and I could count on my team here with Helen and Abe and, and Jan who do a lot of the hard work in these and then we just colorize them based on the color communication and the photography that we use. And we do a lot of cases that way. So I'm not opposed to monolithics. And I wanna be really clear about that. Again, a monolithic first by cuspid here. I think it blends and harmonizes very nicely and I have no problem with it. And as we get into even more complex cases, maybe an anterior tooth where I don't normally do a lot of monolithics, but I will for the right case and the right amount of space. And, and this young patient, um, functionality wasn't an issue, which is a discolored tooth that uh, the patient had from a trauma years ago. And, and our job is really to do all the same things that I would normally do. What is the chroma in the cervical? How much value do I need? And what is the age or the effect of that incisal edge, whether it's a maxillary tooth or a mandibular tooth? I'm still thinking the same about how I'm affecting my incisal edge position. So can I treat this monolithically? Sure, as long as I can match the values and the translucencies and I have space to use a similar material and similar thicknesses, I don't think it's an issue at all. Uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, in other cases, that this is just external stains, by the way, and monolithic uh, ST zirconia, uh, that's the Vita zirconia that I use predominantly. Um, and I've gone through this before, so I don't want to really dive into this too much, but when I am staining on monolithic materials, I just did a whole webinar on it, so I'm not going to spend time talking about it again today, but the key with these materials really is to control the viscosity of the materials, right? So if I'm going to monolithically try to do something, how I mix in my glaze base and how I really create the right thickness or viscosity of that material is going to be a big part of that. Also, you understanding what materials really work and don't work. And what I mean by that is manufacturers, including Vita, tell you every stain is fluorescent. I would tell you it's not true. Some stains are highly fluorescent. Even though some stains have fluorescence in them, you will never see it and it will never react the way you think it does. Because once you start adding in more and more color, chromatic pigments, you start to lose the ability to see the fluorescence of those materials. So again, my job is to understand that. And we covered all this, I think, in the last webinar. So I'm just kind of touching on it because I'm going to compare the difference between monolithics and the incisal edge and, and layered in the incisal edge. 
And the only other aspect that I'll add in is we can actually also use the colorations of some of this things mixed in, I'm sorry, mixed in with our uh, stain paste type materials or our fluorescent stain materials. And that's becoming very popular today with a lot of these more pasty kind of colors that people are using to micro layer stains on the restorations. And, and, and I'm kind of a fan of that. Um, but I can create them sometimes on my own by just mixing in a little bit of a glaze paste and a little bit of the stain that I want it to be. So a bluish color or an amber color or a whiter color that I want to mix in and I can use it as a micro layer to actually create a little thickness and a little bit of coloration, especially on an incisal edge. That's more important to me when I'm working in um, lithium desilicates or zirconias. And the reason it's more important for me on those areas is because those materials are very non-absorbent. Um, they're high megapascal materials, which means they're very hard and brittle. And that means when I put stain on them, I don't really get that stain to seep into the material. It kind of stays floating on that surface. So what I would really rather do is though is just use something more pasty where I can create a little bit of a layer of the color. And that's why in those cases, I'm using more of that mix of stain and uh, fluorescent paste to it to get a little bit more of that coloration in it. If I'm doing it with feldspathic materials, and I think most of you know that I'm a big fan of the feldspathic materials, I can still mill these. So this could be a monolithic material. Um, this is the, the Mark II. Most people know I call it Evolve, even though that's not really the name. Um, the Mark II material is uh, a feldspathic material that I'm milling, so it's monolithic, and I can actually paint my stains on that material. The only difference is because it's feldspathic, I get a much better absorption of the stains. I don't have to do anything fancy with it, like mixing it with glaze paste and kind of creating thickness with it. I can actually place it right on my, zircone, my, my feldspathic material and get a much better look out of that. So that's kind of my goal if I if I can use a feldspathic material that I'm working with. And I think if you take a close-up book of this, again, this is just milled feldspathic and all the coloration that you see there is nothing but stain materials, right? So um, it can work and then I can glaze and polish and get everything that I'd want out of that material and I feel like I'm really comfortable. Also, if I'm using zirconias or lithium desilicates, in this case, zirconia, I'm going to probably go back to um, some micro staining and then extra staining with mixing in a glaze paste or some other units to create that, some other materials to create that incisal edge. And the reason that I would do that is because if, if I'm choosing to use zirconia or in a case like this, um, I'm thinking not only aesthetically, but I'm thinking functionally. Um, my first choice on a case like this, to be honest with you, would be old school metal ceramics. Why? Because look at the connector size that I have here. It's not going to be an implant place. It's going to be a Maryland type bridge and I have a very small connector. And I can make that in metal and then layer my ceramic here. And that would be the ideal scenario. I'd probably do a window veneer on the um, cuspid to fill the space a little bit better because there's a lot of space there. But um, the doctor was asking me to make this as a monolithic zirconia material. And I'm okay doing it as a monolithic zirconia. Why? Because I need I need it to be monolithic to keep to my connectors thicker and stronger. Otherwise, I'm gonna have a very weak connector onto my um, the wing that I'm gonna be shooting my Maryland bridge off, right? So uh, I'm picking that material, but now I gotta make sure I can utilize the aesthetics of that material. So of course, I wanna know if I'm filling the space, which I'm going to on the cuspid. Uh, I'm going to try to close that three millimeter gap to maybe two, 2.5. This way I can make a normal size looking lateral. We'll design this all digitally and then I'll make it where if you also notice my Maryland bridge, I actually have a little bit more material on the, the, the facial mesial side of that cuspid. So we're going to actually place that and extend the tip of the cuspid over. So it's all one piece. I'm gonna make the doctor a jig so when they're inserting that and they're gonna get a little tissue pressure, they're gonna make sure that seats the right way, but in the end, it's just gonna be a monolithic uh, restoration and that's gonna work for us. It's gonna give us all the colorations we need and the strength that we need. So we can do it, um, but can they all be? And that's really the question I think for me that I was kind of challenging with today. When should they and which should they not be? So if we look at case of a patient like this, in a case like this, um, the patient has fairly long teeth, they have some spaces, 
can this be a monolithic case or should this be a layered case? Well, that really depends on a few things. Let's look at it from a different perspective. First, we do the normal things we would normally do. Let's wax the case. Um, I'm not gonna wax full contour on the cuspids because these are gonna be minimally invasive. I don't need to do full preparations. They're nice looking teeth on the cuspids. Make our matrix, provide that back to the doctor for them to do the aesthetic evaluation. And then once we get what we like and we see what we like, now it's easier to start doing the APT technique. And that's where the doctor is actually going to insert my wax up and actually start prepping through my wax up. So it's gonna give us a, 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 a little bit of information about how much tooth structure we should take away. She's a young patient. We wanna save as much tooth structure as possible. So we're gonna prep the incisal edge. We're gonna cut a little facial depth cut. And most of this is still in the acrylic that we put on the patient's teeth. So we don't have to do much damage to the teeth behind it. And then once we have everything prepped and cleaned up, we now have a reference point about how much space we're gonna to have to work with. And our spacing should be uh, minimally invasive and it should also be light reflective, meaning I don't want any sharp or, or angulations on that preparation design as I'm working my way through it. I don't want any sharp angles. So I really wanna be careful of that. And you're gonna notice that after this case is fully prepped, uh, I'm gonna kind of go back and give you a shadow of where the tooth used to be. And when I look at this, I say, hmm, I don't have a lot of space to fill. I do have to manage those aesthetic and size ledge positions and I need more material here and less material here. I need more material here, less material here. Would one monolithic material work for that? I'm not sure, and I'm gonna tell you that in the end, I didn't feel comfortable doing this as a complete monolithic case, unless I was gonna do it in a felspathic monolithic, and I would use the Mark II for that. All right, so the goal was, if I'm going to do it that way, I wanna make sure that I can fill the spaces with the right opacity and the right translucency and the right coloration for that to happen. And once I've done that, you can see there are pretty thin micro veneers across the board. We could stain and glaze those, polish them up, and get everything to be about just about where we want them to be. And here's our final for our patient. So it worked as a monolithic felspathic. Would it have worked as another type of monolithic material? Maybe lithium to silicon, but I might have treated my um, positioning maybe a little less thickness, so I could have applied more stain and a coating of maybe a a fluorescent pasty type thing to get a little more space in the final restoration and keep the incisal, the incisal colors the way I wanted them to be. So when you're filling these spaces, be aware, monolithic works well for certain scenarios, but it doesn't work well for all of them. Would I do monolithic in a, in a case like this? Definitely not. Why? Because look at my prep shade, look at the size of that preparation and don't fault the doctor for that preparation. That tooth has been prepped 30 times over the last bunch of years, and now they're getting it restored again before they're gonna lose what's left of that tooth. So I have to fill all that space, and I'm not sure what monolithic material I could fill that space and get the opacity I need, yet still have enough translucency to create that translucent look. And I'm gonna tell you why I treated that case with old school metal ceramics. Why? Because I can mask the dark, gray prep shade that's underneath it, and then I can layer it to get the colorations and, and the things that I need to fill that space. So that's where my value is, and that's where your value needs to be in your laboratories, is knowing when and knowing where. Case like this, very similar to the last case that I just showed you, could this have been monolithic? Maybe, but I chose to go felspathic on this for different reasons. How much length did I need? What were the colorations of the prep shade? Do I want to mill or pressed four different individual crowns that are completely different shades or can I just manage that in my buildup? So I'm managing my space, I'm deciding how much buildup of opacity or translucency I need. I can come back and, and mask the areas where I want to mask them if there was dark prep shades or color discoloration somewhere that I don't like. And then I can actually do a very thin micro layer on these. Uh, a little opacious materials, a little dented materials, enamels and translucencies, and I can get a fairly nice layer. Let me go back one photo, because I, I, I took this photo on purpose, because what, what I wanted you to see is that they were super thin veneers. You could see the stone coming through, but notice when I shadow the light, 
that you don't really lose the definition of how thin or thick they are. And I can control that by using different opacities of opacious materials or, or different dentins or different fluorescent type materials. I can't do that in monolithics, right? So that's where the challenge would come in as a monolithic case for me. And all my cases, even bigger cases like this, um, could this be a monolithic case? I'm sure it could, although this is a one piece bridge, this would be, you know, people do it. Not for me, especially for another reason. And the other reason on this case was these are metal implants that I wanted to screw retain from the lingual. So because I'm screw retaining them from the lingual, I had to go metal ceramics on this. So I still do metal ceramics. I know it's not the most popular material. I also still do lots of zirconia. I still do lots of lithium silicate. I still do feldspathic, both layered and milled. So my point is the base of how I'm creating my size edge comes back to me having the knowledge of which material to use and when to use it. And for me, can I create a, a nice looking size edge? I think so. I mean, I can create translucencies and mamelons and, and value and color and chroma with any material. I don't mind if it's PFM, zirconia, or lithium to silicate today. I think I can create the same aesthetics on all of them. The only difference is I really have to be able to think through which material will work well for that particular case. So let me put this all together with a, a final case. This was a case actually that I did with Miles. So uh, it was an interesting case because the patient was um, very particular that she wanted her implant lateral. So we're placing an implant in this position here, that would be the number 10 or, or the 2-2. Um, we're placing an implant there. And the patient was very specific that all she really wanted to do was make sure that her new implant crown matched the contralateral side. So I have to now take that information and say, okay, what material can I create that with, with the amount of space I have? And let's be clear, when we place an implant, I have all the space in the world. So whether it's gonna be a veneer or it's gonna be an implant restoration, I still have to think about how much space do I have to work to create that incisal edge or to create that position in the restoration that I'm working through. So we went through all the normal things that we would do. We do a diagnostic wax up, we take our shade analysis and evaluate the surface topography and texture of the tooth and the transitions of colors that you see there, a lot of translucency and a lot of zones of color that are on there. Um, and I think, can you create some of that with monolithics? I'm sure you can. And if it was a normal prep, I might think of it a little bit easier. But when I have a lot of space, three, four millimeters of space, which monolithic material do you choose? How much opacity do you want? How do you manage the color and the shape? So for me, I'm already thinking this is gonna be a layered restoration. So for me, I'm gonna take all my shades and colorations where the implant's gonna be placed and I'm gonna start managing my way through the implant. And just so you know, I went old school metal abutment on this. I could have potentially used a tie abutment, um, but I didn't have a good enough angle to create a screw retained restoration. And I always want my restorations to be retrievable. I want them to be able to be placed in implants and be able to be removed either through a lingual screw or a screw retained restoration. So this restoration could not be screw retained. Um, I made a metal abutment, so I had the most stock of metal in my abutment. I will peg the abutment. And then I also, at the final, I'm gonna make the doctor what we call a little plunger or cement jig. So before they go to actually place the crown, they could fill it with cement and plunge the excess cement out of the crown so we don't have excess cement that uh, is difficult for the doctor to clean. Also, you'll notice that even though I did a metal abutment, I will peg the abutment because I wanted to get the coloration and the, and the color of my abutment into the gingiva. I didn't want the gray metal showing through. What was interesting about this case, case was I actually placed the margins pretty ideal, 0.5 millimeters below the tissue, which is where your margin should be. Um, I provide a jig to the doctor, so when he or she places it, um, they make sure that they're placing the, the abutment in the correct position. And what was interesting is the doctor actually called me during the placement. He said, oh, I, I think the margin placement isn't correct. And really what happened was the patient's tissue changed over a few month period of us working on the restoration. So I actually had to come back, take the restoration, change the marginal position, because you can see here that my margin is no longer 0.5 millimeters below the tissue. 
So I had to redo the abutment or actually remodify the abutment. And because I had built it up as a layered restoration, I didn't have to remake it. I just added marginal materials back to the final restoration to close the space. So that kind of worked out pretty nicely for me. Uh, and in the end, the doctor will get back everything that they need, the abutment, uh, the plunger, the jig for the placement of the abutment, uh, this way they have the ability to, and that was a zirconia crown, and so they have the ability to make it all blend and we know what's gonna work out and harmonize. And in the end, uh, I think it worked pretty well. The patient was happy. Uh, this is on insertion, so I think they'll get hopefully even a little bit more tissue development here, but I think you can see the zones and the values and all the details that I had to create. And I did that on a zirconia core over a metal abutment. So again, just thinking through the materials and how we work through them. So um, I hope I made my point here. Like I said, I know we had done one or two versions of incisal edges and I, I kind of wanted to take a different path on this. And, and the goal of this for me was really to talk about, be aware and, and have knowledge of truly what all different incisal edges look like, which one is appropriate for the patient, which material will work best when you're developing that incisal edge position. Uh, and again, I really believe that value is the value that makes you viable to the clinicians and the partners and the patients that you work with uh, across the board. So with that said, let's see, that should be pretty, uh, I'm actually a little early, so that's good. So that'll leave us a, a few minutes extra for some questions if we have any. So I'll stop here, Jim, and I'll say thank you. Uh, and I hope we, we hit the point of, of uh, this topic again. Uh, Peter's got some additional webinars coming up and some other things that we have uh, programmed. So uh, please ch continue to check us out. Visit us to see when the next uh, webinar may be that you're uh, waiting for. And that can also be found on our Vita North America YouTube or the Vita North American website uh, on agenda. Uh, next year, we do have some Germany destination courses signed up. Uh, that if you're interested, please contact us, uh, the education department. Uh, those are next year, 2024. Uh, it's a great time to go visit the, uh, the Vita factory and do some things there, whether it's uh, denture or CAD CAM. Again, if you're interested, please uh, contact us. And then we have uh, SCAD. Peter mentioned it earlier. Um, so yes, SCAD, and it's a com uh, combined program conference with what's also called ProSec. And this is your um, top echelon uh, speakers throughout the U.S. and Europe, uh, around the world. Uh, Peter is also, he's included in that. He mentioned that he's going to be with uh, doing kind of a tag team with uh, Dr. Miles Cohen. It's going to be an excellent presentation, I know. Uh, from Peter and Dr. Cohn, uh, that's going on. Um, even though this is uh, kind of high end as far as the speaking goes and the presentation and the and the, and the material and the quality of the photos, this is for us. Um, us meaning technicians, the everyday people. We want everyone to uh, to join us and spend time and learn. So we're just helping put together all these uh, speakers in one place so that you can uh, learn, take two days out and learn in Chicago uh, this November. Um, and there's a lot to learn from all of these uh, different speakers from different philosophies and so forth. So I hope you, hope you join us. If you're interested, please get a hold of us and we will uh, help you out. Uh, again, Peter's been gracious to give us uh, his contact information. So please, uh, if you want, you can contact Peter. Give him some time, though. He is uh, working and traveling quite a bit. So if he doesn't get back to you right away, don't don't think anything of it. It's uh, not personal. It's that he is uh, really busy. Uh, so as far as questions go, Let's see what we have here. Let me I go to the question page, bring it out. Um, one question is, if you are layering Mark II, is there a minimum thickness that you have to uh, stick to? Yeah, that's a great question. So if I'm going to layer on Mark II, and by the way, I don't always have to layer on Mark II, but if I'm going to layer on Mark II, 
Um, it's it's really you don't want more than 30 percent, 40 percent ceramic. I think uh, Jim may tell you. I think the technical is 40 percent. I would tell you you want to stay around that 30 percentile if you can. And most of the time when I'm layering on a Mark II, it's usually veneer, so it's a micro layer. If I'm going to layer, I don't really need a lot of ceramic. All right. And um, do you always create the mamlons or halo effects internally, or is there a time that you create it with uh, external stains? So I think that's kind of was the point of, of this webinar a little bit. It, if I'm in monolithic materials, I have no choice but to create it externally, right? And, and, and the only question becomes is, if I create it on a monolithic material like a, a Mark II or something feldspathic, I feel like staying right to the surface works very nicely. If I'm doing it on zirconia especially, or even sometimes lithium to silicate, then I want to kind of leave myself a little bit more microns of space where I could use a little thickness of, of material, maybe mix it with a glaze paste and kind of create a little bit more thickness and then glaze over that. If I'm layering, then I'm building my mammalons in. So those are really the three versions uh, of, of my, my um, mammalon structures. And a follow up: uh, if you if you are going to use some effect forces to make your um, mammals or, or halo effects, uh, is there a specific type, opacity, color you like to use? I know you mentioned it earlier, but it, it differs, it changes. Yeah, I think um, so. I'm a big fan of mammal materials in general because they have fluorescence, but. In today's world where I'm doing much more micro layering, I don't have the same space that I used to have when I was fully layering, right? So if that's the case, <clears throat> my mammalon material either has to be used much thinner or I might mix my mammalon material. So maybe I'm mixing a mammalon material and a, uh, a higher value dentin as an example. I, you know, if I'm, I'm in VM9 as an example, I might use mammalon one and throw in a little bit of a OM1 dentin to kind of cut the opacity of that mammalon. Or I could just use it thinner. The other thing that I'll do sometimes if I have a very little space is I might mix a stain into one of my mammalons or one of my effects. So again, I'll go back to uh, VM9 as an example. If I'm using um, effect chroma one, which is a very whitish color, um, I might put a little dot of an ambery or a peachy stain into that and use that as my mammalon material. So I have the opacity and the brightness of that mammalon material, even though it's technically a chroma material, effect chroma material. And then I've added a little bit of warmth into it with a dot of stain. So when I'm fighting for space, um, I'm sometimes playing with the material to give myself what I need it to be in that micron area that I'm working in. And for a, a beginner, uh, can you recommend an article or a book that helps uh, them develop more skill? Um, I, I think from a beginner perspective, you know, I wish I could say there was one article or one book that kind of helps it. I think really what helps most is, is shape and form. So obviously the old Carioca book, uh, which shapes and forms, was fabulous. As far as layering goes, I think, wow, there's so much online today. I know I have a billion things and there's so many things that you can pop onto on YouTube that... Uh, it gives you simplified layering. All I would warn people of is when you're starting to develop that layering process or going back to the relearn layering process, always think shape and form and always understand space because those are really the two keys that that really set you apart when you when you start to colorize a restoration. So when you work with the incisal edge, um, do you uh, veneer? Do you wrap over the incised ledge or do you make it just to the incised ledge? I know it, everything, it depends, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's both. Um, I would much rather create my own halo than use the lithium the silica or zirconia to do it. Have I ever done it? Of course. It really depends on the case and the space and the functional capabilities with that envelope that we talked about before. Um, but in an ideal world, I would much rather create it myself and, and finish the the halo with my own materials. And by the way, to go back to the other question, my halo material might be a mix of several materials also. It might be a dentin, it might be a translucent, it might be an effect chroma, it might be a dot of stain in it. It might be all of those things depending on what kind of a halo I'm trying to create and how much space I have to work in. All right. Um, so uh, the question, it, has, it reflects on the uh, implant case that you did. And the question is, uh, 
at the time the dentist uh, wants to use the plunger you made for cementation, uh, does some of the cement stick to the plunger? If it does, I don't care, right? The bottom line is the, the purpose of the plunger. If, if you, it's funny, years ago, we did a study at, at the Quay Center where we, we put doctors in groups of 10, gave them a crown in cement and told them to cement the crown to a type of that model. And we basically just watched them all do it. And when you watched them do it, it was funny because everyone had such a different technique about how they cemented. There was no rationale. Some people just fill the entire crown with cement and then push it on. Some people go in there and try to paint it in perfectly. And in the end, you don't know. So the concept of the plunger, really more an implant world, is just so they could put a lot in or a little, I don't care. And now they're taking that plunger and pushing in and out and just getting a nice thin even coat. So if some sticks to it or not, I don't care. If some comes in and out, I don't care. All I really want is a nice thin even coat. So on the insertion, they're not getting excess cement that goes under the tissue. And the real reason for that in implant world is because um, implant failure, the number one cause, is basically from cement. When the cement goes underneath the tissue, and touches the bone in the implant, that's when we lose the most amount of implants today. So it's really an implant world that I'm plungering most of those cases. If we're uh, part, part two of that question was, do you ever use a, um, a lubricant or some kind of a, a separator? No, okay. If they do in their offices, I don't know. And by the way, the, the plunger that we made there was resin. Uh, most of the time we'll make the plunger out of a putty material. So just a normal like putty like we make a matrix from. And those are pretty smooth, so I, I, I'm assuming it doesn't stick to it very well. All right. Uh, do you ever mix your? I think you mentioned this before, uh, and just in part of the question. So another question was: Do you ever mix your uh, stain colors with force and effects? And if so, when? But I think you covered that in a previous question. I, I do it a lot, and I probably do it a lot more. I, I, maybe a little less today. I, I take that back. A little bit more today because of the micro layering, right? So because I'm working in less space and I'm doing more micro layering, it forces me to kind of think through the material a little bit. So the example I can give is, I only have two, three tenths of a millimeter that I'm gonna micro layer on my substructure coping in the cervical area. And I know I wanna create some translucency and some chroma there. If I use a, a powder that's too high in chroma, um, I may not get the effect that I need opacity wise yet if I use something that's too translucent I'm going to see right through to the coping so that's an area where I say maybe I'm going to throw a dot of chroma into the normal dentin that I would have used and this way I kind of create that floaty color around the cervical area and I could do that with mammalons I could do that with halos I could do that in any area that I really feel comfortable with so I think in micro layer it's almost more important to be able to do a, a little mix here and there when you need it all right. Um, let's see. When you uh, on di when you do digital design, uh, do you do all your design, your cutback in the software, or do you do anything post mill to refine it? You know, it's funny. I think we've gone through every version of this over the last few years, and there was a point where where Jen does most of all the designs in here. And when Jen was designing, I wanted her to create mammalani structures and, and ins and outs and I have to be honest, I kind of don't even do that anymore. I really just want the coping as thin as possible, and I'm gonna micro layer on, or layer, you know, on that coping. And in truth, I don't get the, you know, I don't wanna sound uh, harsh, I guess, in this, but if you're gonna micro layer four tenths or six tenths, does it really matter? <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, I think we get a little lost in, in, in what we're trying to, if I'm gonna layer a ceramic, does it matter if I'm layering eight tenths of a millimeter or four tenths of a millimeter? All that matters is that I know what I'm using and why I'm filling the space. So I've really kind of gone the opposite way where when we're doing lingual zirconia or lithium to silicate and we're, we're layering the facial, I don't mind layering, you know, a few more tenths of a millimeter to get a little bit better color or a dentin on it. All right. Uh, when you use zirconia for a monolithic crown, do you select the final shade or do you start with a zirconia with a higher value? Always a higher value. Always, um, almost always higher value with the zirconia, especially depending on thickness. So the more space I have, the higher the value of the zirconia needs to be. 
because the thicker you get, the lower value it becomes in nature. All right. And then uh, last question, uh, when you opaque uh, your implant abutment, uh, are you used to using a powder or a paste? It doesn't matter. Um, it, it doesn't really matter in the sense that um, if, you, if you're casting the abutment, um, I can cast it in a metal ceramic metal, so I have the ability to just put a peg on it and fire it normal. If it's a titanium abutment, you can't do that unless you use titanium ceramics. The other option is use a metal bonder and composites. So there are great op composite opegs, and those actually work very nicely. The only negative with those are if you cement the crown, in other words, if you make it like a screw mentable crown where you put the opeg on, you make the crown, and then you cement it and send it back to the doctor in one piece. If it comes back to you for a shade adjustment or a change, you then have to burn the cement out. And when you burn the cement out, you lose some of the composite on the metal. So what we've done to compensate for that is we don't cement the final restoration on the abutment anymore. We let the doctor final cement it in this way. We don't have to worry about they do send it back for a contact or a color adjustment or something. It was never cemented to start with. Yeah, that makes sense. It saves you a lot of headaches, right? Yeah, definitely. Although um, I had a doctor who sent me one back and said, I don't want to cement this, you do it for me. I'm like, but you're right there with the patient. And he's like, no, I'll send it back to you. And I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, hopefully it worked out. So uh, so, uh, uh, Peter, thank you very much for your time today. I know Thanks. the uh, those that attended uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure we'll be looking forward to your next uh, webinar with you. Another topic. And any last words before we uh, let you go? No, I think um, hopefully I'll see a few people. I think I'm in Canada next month, uh, two times or three times. So I'm looking forward to being in Canada. And then November in, in uh, the SCADA meeting, I really hope to see a lot of people sign up and come for that. It's going to be a great meeting. And I look forward to seeing you one of these days, Jim, back out in Calgary. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Uh, for sure, I'll see you in SCAD. So. Uh, so thank you everybody, everyone for joining us today. Um, join us again uh, for future uh, webinars from, from Peter. We're also we're trying to work on some workshops for this year, later on this year, uh, as soon as we get those together and uh, organized and scheduled, we'll let everyone know. And that'll be fantastic because we'll try to do some, um, you know, in-person uh, workshops as well. So we'd love to. Thank, thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you again, Peter. Have, enjoy your day, and thank you, everyone, for in, uh, attending this webinar. And this will uh, end today's Vita uh, Academy webinar with Peter PV. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.